So the last thing that I wanted to ask about before we get into the, some of some of the specifics is less conceptually charged, but it's just more of a term that I imagine many of our listeners won't be familiar with. And limiting ourselves to cellular life for now, since I know the term has unrelated, I think they're unrelated uses in geology. But what is morphogenesis? Hmm. Yeah. Um, so morphogenesis refers to the ability to, uh, well, I'll, I'll say it two different ways and then, and then, uh, we'll see how they, they come together. So, so one, the, the traditional way of thinking about morphogenesis are systems that, um, shape themselves in, in, uh, structurally or anatomically. So it's kind of interesting. I, I, I think it's super interesting that Turing, who was obviously interested in uh, mind and computation and very, these, these very, um, you know, kind of, uh, cognitive kinds of things also wrote a paper on morphogenesis. He, he, he wrote the, he wrote a paper on trying to understand how, uh, this simple, uh, well-mixed, um, chemicals can, can have form, can, can cr- create forms that are not just a, uh, a a random a random distribution. So morphogenesis, we see morphogenesis in every day in embryogenesis when you start with one cell and you end up with a with a frog or a human or an oak tree or whatever. That's morphogenesis. That's well, morpho is space, uh, and so and so it's the idea that uh, it's a process that uh, creates complex shape and structure. That morphogenesis happens in, in embryos. It happens during regeneration. So if you have a salamander, you cut off the, the leg, the leg will regrow. These cells are undergoing morphogenesis. They will make a leg. Uh, morphogenesis happens in metamorphosis when tadpoles become frogs or caterpillars become butterflies. Uh, morphogenesis has some interesting um, failure modes, such as cancer, where the cells uh, don't know what to build and they sort of uh, disrupt the, uh, the this kind of like this uh, dissociative identity disorder of that um, morphogenetic system. Uh, so that's 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 the conventional definition of morphogenesis. I'll, I'll I'll give a different definition, which I think means the same thing, but is a different way to think about it. Morphogenesis is a walk through anatomical morphospace. If you think about the a virtual space of all possible shapes that something can be, then changing shape, or from let's say from a single cell to um to to a, to a you know an embryo, or metamorphosis, or some kind of change in shape, or in fact even maintaining your shape while all the stuff within you changes, right? So molecules come in and out, cells die and are replaced. All this stuff is going on. Even standing still in morphospace space is a very, is a very important process. So, so, so another way to think about morphogenesis is that it's a navigational task in anatomical space. And now there are some questions about how good are you at navigating this space? What kind of perturbations can you resist? Uh, what do you measure to know where you're going? What do you remember about where you're supposed to go? My 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 second definition recasts this problem into a very sort of cognitive sounding set of tasks, and that's on purpose. And I think and I think those are two 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 sides of the same two sides of the same coin. Limiting ourselves to that first definition for the moment, M, I correct roughly that while on the one hand all of our cells contain our DNA, which is, I mean, their instruction manual, so to speak. And on the other, we're composed of bodies that exhibit certain observable characteristics like height and eye color and so on, our phenotypes. It's morphogenesis then that links the two, whereby the cells that constitute us or that execute on their instructions then take up the specific forms that determine what we are. Uh, well, yeah, the, the thing, the thing that's, de- that the, the thing that uh, definitely is true is that morphogenesis is what sits between the genotype and the phenotype. And we often forget about that because people say, you know, the, or even when they do simulations, you got the genome and then you got this, this phenotype. Well, the DNA is actually not an instruction manual. The DNA, uh, is, a, is a hardware, is a description of your hardware that you have, the parts that the microscopic parts that every cell gets to have. So, so most of the hard work actually is done in that layer. So you've got your genome, you've created some hardware. Now that hardware has to do something, including assemble itself and then run various behavioral repertoires in different spaces. And then eventually you get to judge how well it did in that and selection can act on that. But, but all the heavy lifting is done in that middle layer because, uh, for most things that we're interested in, there are no, there, there isn't a gene for it. It's uh, you know, there's a, there's a few like single cell, single gene diseases and things like that. But 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 the vast majority of um, uh, of of the things we're interested in are very complex consequences 
of some amazing software that runs on this genetically specified hardware and that so that's physiology and so and so then once you realize that you can ask lots of interesting questions like what what is the competency level of that process and what does it know how to do and uh, what implications are there for evolution? In fact, um, you know, I, I've, I've written a little bit about this, and now we, we're going to have some some empirical work coming on this in a couple of months, showing what what happens to the evolutionary process when you're dealing with an agential material like cells that that is not just a straightforward mapping from genotype to phenotype. Very interesting things happen when you do that. So. Um, yeah, morphogenesis is really key to a lot of these problems that people argue about. Hmm. And then one last thing, you said that the morphogenesis is playing the the heavy role in that layer between genotype and phenotype. And am I right that over the past, I mean, 50 years, we've we've learned a lot about genes and we've learned a lot about DNA but morphogenesis is really still a crucial missing part in our knowledge that is really important going forward and now. Yeah, well, I mean, it's certainly true that developmental biologists have known that morphogenesis is important for hundreds of years. And as and 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 many of many uh, of my colleagues uh, over the years have highlighted all kinds of information about morphogenesis. So, so I definitely don't want to get, um, make the claim that, which which sometimes you hear that claim too, is that that no one knows how this works. It's a total black box. It's not a total black box. People have discovered many interesting things about morphogenesis. Uh, certain things we actually know how they work. I mean, there's been there's been a lot done. Developmental biologists have done a great job with a lot of it. Uh, having said that, I I do think that there are very crucial questions about morphogenesis that we haven't even gotten at all close to and uh i could give you a couple of interesting examples but like you know one of the things i say to my students is so 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 we look at a developmental biology textbook and say look look at all these you know and then every chapter tells some stories you how does this work how does that work and i say okay let's look at the white space let's look at all the stuff that's not here right what isn't here what are what are all the things that just isn't here because because we don't know how to tell the story. So, so one one very simple question um, I could pose is this. So let's say uh, so 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 ax- axolotls, right? These little salamanders. So a- baby axolotls have four, have legs, and um, uh, tadpoles of the frog uh, do not have legs. And so in my lab, we make something known as a frogolotl. So a frogolotl is a bunch of uh, frog cells together with a bunch of axolotl cells, and you mix them. And and so now I can ask a very simple question. You have the frog genome. It's all sequenced, annotated. You have the axolotl genome. Can you tell me if the frog axolotl is going to have legs or not? And that's a very similar question to, pl- for example, planaria. These flatworms that regenerate. Right. So, so you take two planaria with different head shapes. You cut off the head of one of the planaria. You repop. You you take some 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 of the um, neoblast the stem cells from the other from the other type of worm. You you put put them into the first worm. Uh, what what head shape is it going to have? Is it going to have? Is one of the two head shapes going to be dominant? Is it going to be some in between shape? Uh, is the head in fact going to switch back and forth between the two shapes because neither set of cells is ever satisfied about what what shape is there and it's going to try to break it down? You now there's an old like Three Stooges uh, cartoon of them trying to uh, uh, trying to build a table or something and each one has a different idea of what they're building and so of course they just keep sawing and adding and so on. So. Uh, We've done a great job with genetics. We are, have a pretty good understanding of the hardware, I would say. But these kind of collective decisions, when the group of cells needs to decide what type of head to make or how, whether we're going to make legs or not, we, we, we're not even we're not even uh, at the beginning of having mature understanding of this. And this has massive implications for biomedicine, for limiting the technologies like CRISPR uh, and things like for DNA, DNA editing and all the things you can do with with genomes, because there is no easy mapping from a genome to uh, whatever you're interested in in the in the anatomical structure, um, and that's why we talk about um, uh, the anatomical compiler as a sort of uh, far off aspirational goal, which we're nowhere nowhere near. Um, yeah, so I think it's both. I think I think there's plenty of information on on morphogenesis from the mechanistic side, and the decision making of it, the competencies, the problem solving, uh, we still are very bad at. I'd like to talk a bit more about the frogolotl. The first time I've I've said that word out loud. Am I right that this is what's referred to as a chimera in your lab? 
Okay, so because it is two types of life that are merged. Yeah, together. it's a mix, and people have been, people have been making chimeras for for a really long time. It's it's very popular in the plant world. You can make. I mean, one of the cool things about biology is that it's uh, super um, uh, interoperable. So you can mix all kinds of stuff, and it just works. And we can talk about why that is. That's that's, that's an interesting uh, source, I think. But um, yeah, you can make chimeras out of all sorts of things. Well, doesn't it just presumably work because all life runs on DNA? It's got the same instruction manual, so to speak. No, no, no you can make. No, I don't think that's true. You can. You can. Uh, this is why you know uh, you can. As you see papers every day, we took cells and we put them on this weird uh, tungsten, uh, you know, alloy with this thing, and we stuck some electrodes in there, and then we used these nanomaterials, and then we three D printed the whole thing into. A, and it, it's you, I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't think I don't think that's what it is. I mean, I mean, it certainly helps that uh, uh, it, it certainly helps what uh, to interface to things if they're making some of the same, uh, let's say, um, range of signals and and so on, which the DNA contributes to by by determining some of the hardware. But life is interoperable with all sorts of stuff that has no DNA and has you know never been in the stream of life. Okay, right. No, that makes sense. And then returning though to the frog allotles, how how specifically do you make one? So, uh, so I'll tell you what we do. the The information that we have is rather limiting because uh, we're still very much. Uh, so, so I've been telling this this frog allotle story uh, for a long time because just conceptually, it's very obvious what the what the problem is. We haven't our, our work on it is not published yet. So until it's published and peer reviewed, I'm not going to say too too much about it. But but basically, what you do is you take early embryonic, uh, you take you take material from an early uh, frog embryo, you take material from an early axolotl, and you jam one set of cells into the other, and you let them sort it out, and eventually you get something. So the the question though that I guess I'm not understanding is, does the frog allotl have frog cells and axolotl cells or it only has frog allotl cells uh the cell i, I see uh the cells do not the, the each cell stays uh, the, the cells do not merge so 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 there are no frog allotl cells as such there is there are frog cells there are axolotl cells they are all completely inter intermixed you could make now now you now the cool thing about chimeras and and uh, my grad student vasily and i um, wrote a review on this yeah. uh you can make chimeras at any level of organization. So people make chimeras all the time at the molecular level by taking genes, let's say DNA from one organism and shoving it into the cells from another organism. Then, then you have chimeric cells. We, this is not what we're doing. We have our, our the individual cells are staying staying whole here. Right. And I, I was wondering if the issue was presuming that you were making these frog allotls at the molecular level, you would have access to the genome of the frog allotl, but because you could sequence it, but the problem is then that you still can't determine, even with the DNA, whether or not it would have legs. But that's not where the problem emerges. The problem it's, it's 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 a very similar it's a it's a it's an extremely similar problem. You have so so the thing consists of two sets of cells. You have the genome for both sets of cells. So you've got the frog genome, you've got the axolotl genome. That's it. There is no DNA in this thing for which you do not have the complete sequence. You've got the complete sequence for every cell in this in this organism. Right, but it still seems like a different question because you you have two sets of DNA and you're not sure how they are going to interact, these two groups of cells, versus having one set of DNA and you're just not sure how that whether or not that's going to produce. Well, life. you can go, I mean, you can, you can do it even simpler. Uh, if you didn't already know what a frog was, and you didn't already have the other genomes to compare it with. If I gave you the frog genome, you couldn't tell me what it would look like. Just, just no, never mind the mixture. Just, just the one genome. You would have, you would have no way of telling me what this thing looks like if you didn't, if you couldn't compare it with some other tetrapods and say, well, you know what? I think it's kind of a vertebrate. That, that's that's just that's cheating. That's by comparison with things you already know. But, but even even this even the single genome uh, gives you uh, g gives us gives us this problem because and I'm not saying there's anything th th it's not that there's magic keeping us from discovering this I'm saying that the right answer to this is a, it's a collective intelligence problem it's not a hardware problem it's a problem of of understanding how groups of cells make decisions and how that hardware leads to specific uh, specific outcomes. Hmm. So the point 
either way is that we just don't know enough about morphogenesis to determine this based on the gene. Well, I would say I would say slightly different. Uh, I would say we've been we've been asking a very limited set of questions. So, so so we've been asking lots and lots of really good questions about the hardware, and certainly uh, uh, some people uh, are interested in how. Um, you know, it, it, individual cells respond to various cues and things like that. There's plenty of that. Uh, what I'm saying is we've been missing the part where you have to understand how the collective navigates that anatomical morphospace. space. The, the part where it stores memories, it can learn from experience, it uh, has the ability to decide between different, uh, different options in that space and solve novel problems that it has never seen before, including evolutionarily. All of those are competencies that we have barely begun to study and and mostly because people people assume f philosophically they just assume that they can't exist they say well this is just a chemical system uh therefore i'm going to treat it like a kind of clockwork at best a dynamical system um and that's it and that's my that's my whole point with this having this um uh, spectrum of this this uh, spectrum of cognition <clears throat> is that you don't know where anything goes on that spectrum until you ch until you try until you check and if we sort of you think about um, uh, you think about a bowling ball on a on a landscape, and you 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 have a certain set of uh, tools that you're going to apply to know where the bowling ball is going to go on that landscape, and you really only have to worry about that landscape, right? The bowling ball brings very little of its own to it. It's everything is determined by the landscape, and then you have a mouse on a landscape, and then you have to use a completely different set of tools because the landscape is not nearly as important as the landscape that the mouse thinks it's on. Right? The mouse's internal representation of that landscape, where what's good, what's bad, where does it want to go, where did it have a good time last time or a bad time. But it's, it's, the, it's the mouse's representation of that landscape that's really key if you're going to make predictions or try to control it. And so now you can ask the question, are cells more like the bowling ball or are they more like the mouse? And people make the assumption that they're more like the bowling ball, and I think that's completely wrong. But, but, the, but, the, but, the, but the one thing I know for certain is that you can't answer that question by having feelings about it. You have to do experiments. And, and that's what has, re I mean, we've been doing this for, I don't know, 25 years now. And there's, a, there's, there's other labs that do it too. But the vast majority of the community has barely scratched that surface. Mm. And so the problem, if I heard correctly, is understanding the communication of the cells and how the collective navigates this amorphous space. And if I'm right based on what I read, at least in part, this communication is mediated by bioelectric networks, which you have been working on? Yeah, yeah. The communication is part of it. It's uh, The communication is a critical part because I don't think you can have collective... Well, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't think you can have a collective intelligence without communication between the parts. <clears throat> but it's not the only thing. Because, because again, you can nail down, and, and in fact, people have, nailed down the molecular details of how it works that cells signal to each other that does not automatically give you uh, everything you want to know, which is which is what are the me memories, preferences, goals, competencies, and so on of the collective. That requires a different set of tools that that beyond what uh, the molecular biology of how exactly do these cells talk to each other. But but the answer is, yeah, in, in large part, I mean, of course, they talk to each other chemically and biophysically, but bioelectrically is, is my favorite um, part of that modality.